All right, let's get started. Um, before we get started with the speaker, I have a couple of announcements. Apparently, uh, smart site isn't accessible yet, so I'll have to figure that out. So, since they're trying to get on it, uh, I'm able to, so I'll figure that out and let me know. Um, I made an error in the printed syllabus that I had it handed out regarding the paper. The, the paper, the printed syllabus says at least three presentations, or not, I had explained at least five presentations. So the correct number is five. The syllabus that you will see on Smart Site says, also says five presentations, okay? Um, any questions about, uh, from anything from last week at all? All right, so let's get started with today's speakers. I'm really happy to have Mary Catanasso uh, with us today um, in one way because uh, it's this payback because I've presented to her class at least three times now, so now it's her turn. But she's a really good friend of mine. She's a, uh, I think, one of the most brilliant people we have here on the campus that I, she, she just impresses me every time I talk to her. She's a really good joke color. Um, she's an urban ecologist in the plant sciences department, and she's going to talk about uh, ecology and the uh, design of urban watersheds, how urban design affects the ecology in developed systems, um, which all of you will be um, having to uh, deal with, having to uh, address urban designs. Okay, so, Karen. Okay. Thank you. And with that set up, I'm Dustin Vizale. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, so, um, I, as Mark said, I'm an urban ecosystem ecologist, so I don't have any train, formal training in design. Um, I have helped people teach design studios when I was out in New York, <clears throat> teach urban design studio at Columbia for four years, so I have a little bit of sense of how people think and engage with information, but mostly I've been working towards trying to get ecological theories and concepts into the toolbox of designers, and whether or not that's been met with success, I guess time will tell. But what I'm going to focus on today is something I've titled Slowing the Flow, the Ecology and the Design of Urban Watersheds. Now design there I'm using a little bit loosely based on land cover that's already present. You can also think of restoration and even management as being a form of design, okay, form of management. Um, because I'm using these words flow and watersheds, I'm going to have to define them for you, so I'll give you a little bit of sense very quickly on what a watershed is. It's a really key concept in ecosystem ecology that we use a lot, and it's very helpful for bridging across disciplines. So I'll define it for you, and then I'll of course talk a little bit about hydrology. The ecology I'm going to focus on today is mostly uh, nitrogen and nitrate pollution in the water because it is the primary water pollutant uh, worldwide. So um, I should also say that a lot of my urban work has been done in Baltimore, and that's the picture that you're seeing here. And I am going to give you examples from Baltimore and then shift focus a little bit into Sacramento. And when I do that, I will try to mention that it's really important that you keep in your mind the, let me see if I can, I'm just going to say biogeophysical context, but keep in mind the climate, the climate these two cities are in. They're very, very different, and that's going to influence the processes. Okay. So what is a watershed? Here's a basic diagram of this small watershed concept. Um, ecosystem ecologists use it as a way to quantify the quality and quantity of water leaving a system. So a watershed is simply the land area based on topography where every bit of rain that falls into that area is going to drain, drain because it flows, water flows downhill, right? So it's going to drain out of the system through one stream and then leave the system at one particular point. Okay, so this is a cross section. You can see the soil and the bedrock, and here's the surface. So all the rain and water that comes onto the land surface is going to flow downhill into the stream network, leaving the, leaving the system through the end of the stream. So what that means is that a little ecologist, we have really high-tech tools. We come over here with our bottle, <coughs> sample the water, and that gives us an integrated idea of all the processes that are going on in the terrestrial system. Okay, so that's a basic idea. The small watershed concept, it was developed in Cover Brook in the White Mountains. You can see the ridge line right here. And these are different watersheds. Again, what you're seeing in between the watersheds is a topographical break. You can't make that out. But if you were to walk here, you would go uphill and then downhill and then uphill. Okay, so there's topographical breaks between each of those. And the reason this is so critical is what they did here is they did a clear cut. This was done with Forest Service. They did a clear cut and then monitored consequences of the clear cut on the water quality and quantity going on. Okay, so it's a very good way to integrate the effect of that clear cut across this land area. And then this is what it looks like at the bottom 
where they sample the water, the weird kind of funnels everything in. Okay, so the watershed approach is a good way to learn about ecosystems by analyzing the water draining the system and, and analyzing it for both the quality of the water, as quality, I'm sorry, water quality means the constituents in the water, okay, chemical constituents, constituents in the water, and quantity. So you can apply a disturbance to that landscape. In the example I gave you, clear cut, and analyze the response. Okay, we need to call urbanization a disturbance, but it certainly is an alteration of the system. So there's an alteration that we can have happen on the watershed and analyze the response. It's a good way to analyze the internal dynamics, what is happening within that watershed. And you can also, if you do this year after year after year after year, or season after season after season, you get a very good sense of long-term response because a lot of ecological processes take many years to play out. You don't necessarily know the consequences or the change. And some of those changes are extremely subtle. So if you just have a snapshot in time, you might miss them. And it's a logical unit of study. It's got a defined boundary based on the topography. In some landscapes, in Baltimore in particular, it also is a logical uh, unit of study from a social perspective because many of the communities organize into watersheds, watershed associations. So it's also a logical unit of study in terms of a friends of fill-in-the-blank watershed, for example. Okay, so let's go to Baltimore. So here's a concept that came out of the core of ecosystem ecology, right? A bunch of pretty conceptual and theoretical ideas, but now we're applying it to an urban landscape. So this is great because we have ecologists that go out and run around the woods and think that humans, anything that humans touch has been destroyed and therefore they won't study it, right? They don't go into cities typically, although we're starting to now. And we dragged them in kicking and screaming using a very basic concept from, the, from their own field. Okay, so they have a hook to grab onto. So the watershed concept. And here's Baltimore, city of Baltimore here, county of Baltimore here. It sits on the Chesapeake Bay and here's the uh, direct three watersheds of, of well, the drain Baltimore City uh, that go in then to the Chesapeake Bay. And I'm most, you're going to see this shape a lot, okay? This is the Gwens Falls watershed. It's a watershed I spent a lot of time researching. So you're going to see that shape a lot. But here it is up close. Um, again, here's the Chesapeake Bay down here. I've outlined the watershed here in black. So again, that's the topographical break. All the rain that falls above this is going to go down the Gwens Falls water the river and drain into the Chesapeake Bay. All these red circles is where we've been collecting water samples weekly since 1997. So there's your long term, there's your water, trying to integrate across the system. Uh, if you sample here, it's integrating everything that happens upstream. If you sample here, it's integrating everything that happens upstream. Here, everything that happens upstream. Okay, you see what I'm getting at? You'll notice a couple of these are off the main stem, and that's because we're trying to get the comp the effects of these little side catchments that eventually feed into this big river. Okay. So that's the idea. So it drains into the Chesapeake Bay, and a picture of the Chesapeake in downtown Baltimore, Inner Harbor. And one of the big concerns in the area is the pollution from upstream or terrestrial systems into the bay. Now this becomes very important in terms of then uh, what influences that nitrate input into the bay. And that's where this design and management piece Okay, because it's a particularly important input. So here's the Chesapeake Bay. Nitrogen, as I mentioned, is a critical water pollutant um, worldwide. And I'm going to focus primarily on the form of nitrogen that is nitrate. And I'll give you some more details of that in a minute. But it causes algal blooms, which you can see in this photo here. You can see this really green, soupy stuff. Nitrogen is a limiting nutrient for a lot of plant material, including algae. And so if you give them more nitrogen, their populations explode. So what causes uh, water pollution? A lot of it is agriculture, but urban and suburban is certainly there, and I'm going to focus on that. In agriculture, it's mostly ammonium from fertilizer, right? And from suburban and urban watersheds, it's a combination of a lot of different inputs, different sources, fertilizer use on the homeowner level, pet waste, atmospheric deposition from car exhaust and fossil fuel combustion, putting nitrogen into the atmosphere, then rains down um, later. And then also uh, leaky sewage systems, okay? Either broken pipes um, or sometimes if there's mixed sanitary and sewer together, we have overflow problems. Okay, in some places in Baltimore, the pipes are still the original wood pipes, so we have a leaky infrastructure. So there's a lot of different sources. Okay, don't freak out. It's okay. This is the basic <laughs> Everyone freaks out when they first see it. 
So let, I've got to simplify it into a few key things, and we're going to use it as an organizing tool for the things I'm going to talk about. Okay. So basic idea is you've got nitrogen coming into your system, right? I just gave you all the sources there for urban systems: the fertilizer, atmospheric deposition, sewage. So that's your input. This is what we're concerned about, output, leaving the system. We don't want nitrogen to leave the terrestrial system and go into the aquatic system. That's water pollution, right? To simplify. So it goes in as ammonium or nitrate. Ammonium going in quickly gets transferred to nitrate in the system. But the important thing is that nitrate is the highly mobile form. It moves through soil very, very fast and goes into water. It moves with water, okay? So it's very mobile. So we don't want this. What can we do? We have to either keep it in the landscape by having the plants take it up. Remember, nitrogen is limiting, so plants need it too. So if there are plants there, it will suck up that nitrate and use it to grow and photosynthesize. So that's one way through biotic uptake that we can take that nitrogen up and prevent it from going out. The other way is through a process called denitrification, and that's where essentially it goes out back into the atmosphere as gas. And that's OK, too, because our atmosphere is a little less than 80% nitrogen. Okay? So the, the point here is to keep it out of the water. We do that by keeping it on the land, the plants, or we do it by blowing it back out to the atmosphere. OK, see, we survived the basic nitrogen cycle. So how does nitrogen flow in urban watersheds? <clears throat> OK, so we all know that water flows downhill, and nitrogen comes with water. So in an urban watershed, when we build a slope, what happens when the rain comes in is the water either leaves the system through eva uh, evapotranspiration from the plants, it goes down the surface of the soil, it percolates into the deep groundwater, and through all these different mechanisms, eventually ends up in the stream, right? And what happens when you build on the, on the watershed? What happens is that you intercept a lot of that water. You've lost a lot of the trees, you've removed them, so less water is being taken up and evaporated back out of the atmosphere. More is going into pipes. That's what engineers do. They design pipes to get water off of systems as fast as possible, right? So a lot of that water is going to go into pipes and go leave the system and get dumped into the river in one defined point. So as a consequence, we're altering, and I'll show you support for all of these things, the quantity, timing, location, and quality of the water leaving these systems. Does that make sense? OK, so what do I mean by quantity and timing? Well, here's a diagram showing you water runoff after a storm. OK, so here's the hours since the storm occurred on the bottom. And this is just how much water is coming off in cubic meters per second. And this is comparing two different systems, an urban system and a system that's been left alone and still in forest. So what happens after a storm and the rain falls is that in an urban system, because it's been designed by great engineers, that water comes off extremely quickly. Okay? Because there's so much hard surface for that water to hit, a lot of that water comes off. Not much of it is retained in the soil and the plants because a lot of that soil and plants have been covered up. So you get a lot of water and you get it coming very fast. You get this really big spike of water flow in your streams. In contrast, a forested system, the soil and the plants can absorb a lot of that water. So much gas is coming off, and it tends to happen a little bit later after the storm. Okay? So consequently, we call urban systems very, very flashy. Okay? So that's going to affect the quantity and the timing of water flow. And the location is affected because of our infrastructure. We often, this pipe would have been at grade at the time that it was put in. But from the years of stormwater flowing into this, as well as stormwater rushing down the stream, you can see that the stream bank has been pretty highly eroded. Okay, so we, instead of having water come in all along the bank, we're now shuttling it in through the pipes to one specific location. Okay, so the infrastructure has affected the flow of the water in terms of location. <coughs> so, uh, why is this here? Oh. The, third, the fourth thing that affects is water quality. And so how do we know that? Well, I mentioned that we've been sampling these streams every single week since 1997. And so from looking at all that data, we can look at the amount of nitrate that we're finding in the water in all of these places. Okay. So here's a diagram showing the nitrate concentration in milligrams of nitrogen per liter of water every single week since from July 1998 to July 05. It's time for me to get a new graph. Okay, but it makes the point I want to make. We've got three parts of the landscape here. Uh, we divided the portion of the watershed that was primarily forested, the ref 
forested sites, and you can see there's very little nitrate coming out of here. Okay, a little bit of blip in the summer when we've got high rain flows, but you see very little nitrate coming out of there because all the trees can go through that biotic uptake, right? Keeps the nitrogen. Okay, the green triangles are what's coming out of the suburban system, and the red squares are what's coming out of what the agricultural system. And not surprising, the agricultural system is losing a lot of nitrate because of the fertilizer application. Don't pay too much attention to the noise. This data is typically very, very noisy. Just look at the big patterns that the agricultural system is generally releasing more nitrate than the suburban system. Now I'm going to show you another graph. And the unfortunate thing is that suburban is going to shift colors. And I apologize. Oh, I did fix it. Never mind. OK, so this is the same setup. Again, you see the force in reference. The suburban is still the green. I removed the agriculture and put in the urban. Okay. This is a big surprise to us that urban is actually lower than suburban. We figured that urban, more intense vacation, less vegetation, we would see uh, worse water quality. In fact, we don't. So we think a lot of this might be homeowner management of our lawns and pet waste and things like that going on. Okay, so how we design and manage and change our landscapes is also going to affect the quality of water in the ecosystem. So if we go back to our basic nitrogen cycle, you can see that the inputs are something we influence, but that interacts then with the landscape to, to determine how much that nitrate's actually going to leave the system. And we mostly have been talking about this biotic uptake piece so far, okay? So we've got water that's coming down faster, we've got more of it. Um, what does it do to the system? And it's dropping into those pipes. What are the consequences for biotic uptake? Well, just like I showed you the picture of the pipe, with all the erosion happening under that. That's happening also um, to the banks of the stream in general and exposing all the tree roots here, okay? So the repairing <coughs> zones, the zones of vegetation that line these rivers is being fundamentally altered because that water is coming through so fast. It's coming, a lot more of it's coming off and it's coming very, very fast. So we're having a lot of erosion that's going into the bay downstream. So we're left with big cobbles here on the floor and we're left with eroded banks and exposed roots of the trees. So what does that mean? It means that the trees can't access the water down here because the whole water table has dropped. And so now we have a disassociation. These are plants that are adjusted to be able to have their, their what we call their feet wet, their roots wet, right? The riparian species are used to having their roots wet. And now we've dropped that water table and they don't. And what we're seeing, if you look at these line, two line bars, which is the urban riparian zone, what you can see is that there are more tree species. This is the number of tree species here. There are more tree species that are actually categorized as upland tree species than wetland tree species now, okay? Which is not like what we find in the non-urban section. So what's happened is with this change in hydrology, and the erosion of the banks and the exposure of the roots and the disassociation now so that those trees can't reach the water anymore, we have shifted the composition of trees from wetland species to predominantly upland tree species. We fundamentally altered our systems. Okay, does that make sense? So our biotic uptake then is going to have some difficulty, right? Because those roots aren't getting there. They're not getting their water from there. It's not able to help in that biotic uptake era. Okay. What's the other option? If we don't, if we've hurt this option, what's our other option? Well, I mentioned this. Transform the nitrogen and blow it off as gas back into the atmosphere. Well, how does that happen? How, what's this denitrification process? What's that about? I never use this kind of animation, but this is the most critical point that constantly gets missed and I made it obnoxious. This denitrification process has to occur in the absence of oxygen. Very critical. What you might hear of as anaerobic conditions. It has to occur in the absence of oxygen. It occurs in the soil. There's lots of oxygen in soil, except when. What affects oxygen content in soil? It's wet. It's wet, right. When it's waterlogged, then there no, there's limited oxygen in water. So you need to have waterlogged soils for this denitrification process to happen. Well, in a regular system, in an unaltered repairing zone, what happens is that the groundwater flow to the stream gets shallower and shallower as you get closer to that stream. And in this repairing zone, it's very shallow. The water table is very close to the surface. That makes the oxygen, dissolved oxygen, go down as the soils are very waterlogged, creating anaerobic conditions. 
and your denitrification, your ability to take that nitrate and blow it off as gas, which the microbes do right there, is really high. Okay? So given what I told you though, here's unaltered, when we alter them, we've caused that erosion, which also leads to a water table drop. The other consequence, because we built the system, is that we're not replenishing that water table as much. So we have both of those dynamics going on. That leads to a drying out of the soil, reintroducing oxygen, and therefore decreasing denitrification potential. So if we go back to our nitrogen cycle, then we've reduced the ability to lose our nitrogen that direction too. Okay? So both of those dynamics, loss of biotic uptake, diminishment of denitrification potential, both of those things are going to lead to an enhanced chance of, lead, of letting nitrate flow out of the system and lead to lower water quality. Okay, so how do we learn about repairing systems and what we can do to design them better? A lot of what we know has come from very classic um, agriculture um, ecology literature. Primarily, a lot of it's actually been done in California, looking at the role of repairing zones in agricultural systems where we know there's been a ton of nitrogen, a ton of fertilizer dumped in systems very, very close to water. Okay, so a lot of really basic research has been done to try to figure out how the nitrogen dumped here influences the water and what can we do to diminish that influence. And this riparian zone here, this wooded ribbon along the river, is very, excuse me, very, very key to that story, as you might imagine from what I've already told you. And this is the kind of work that's been done to try to trace the nitrogen. If you put nitrogen in, here's management inputs, 105, corn takes some up, you know, what moves through groundwater? What this research showed was that this ribbon of vegetation of trees was very, very critical because it took the nitrogen up and retained it and prevented it from going out of the water, okay? So that matches the whole story I've been telling you, right? That's how our understanding of the role of these riparian zones was developed. And when you look in the restoration literature and they're asked what are the top 10 activities associated with riparian management and what are the top 10 activities associated with water quality management, both of the number one um, replies have to do with expanding that buffer or revegetating that buffer. That's our restoration or management approach, increase the buffer. Well, can you do that in cities? No. They're built and designed landscapes. You can't say, I'm sorry, folks, we need to remove half of your neighborhood. We need to plant riparian zone here. That's not really an option in a city. So what we know, we understand the dynamics from basic ecology, but then actually bringing it to some sort of restoration or mitigation um, step is difficult to do in a highly altered landscape. So what have we started to do? Okay, this is a really gross example, but here's the LA River, so there's your repairing zone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, good luck with that. And then there are parts of the landscape where there is you know, some parks and things around the rivers, but again, extremely limited. And does this little remnant patch have any sort of ecological functioning? That's an open question. And it's going to be fairly limited. So what are your options in an urban watershed? Well, here's a picture of that urban watershed again. Here's that black outline I've shown you. The Chesapeake Bay is still there. Here's Baltimore City. But now what I've put on there for you is a land use land cover classification. Okay, so you can see areas that are uh, high intensity residential and medium intensity residential. So there's an awful lot of landscape there. It's not all repairing, but there's an awful lot of landscape. So what we need to do is start thinking about the entire watershed. Get out of the mindset of just thinking about the riparian zone being the only place that land and water come together and the only place you can affect. And instead think about everything. And that's why I think it's so important for people who are designing neighborhoods and designing things that are throughout this watershed to understand these concepts because anywhere that water and land come together is an opportunity to essentially think like the riparian zone. Okay. So, Basic thing that we've been using in Baltimore, because Baltimore is a city in a deciduous forest, I say that cautiously, Sacramento is not, right? We have a, a quick saying, green it up, grade down. Okay, so green it up, plant up the entire watershed. Think beyond the riparian zone, just don't revegetate and expand the riparian zone, vegetation throughout the watershed <laughs> is going to assist in that. And so we've done a lot of it, analyses uh, using remote imagery to try to separate what you're seeing here is the dark green is trees, the light green is grass, and we can lay it then, um, lay individual homeowner parcels on here, and what obviously is not a surprise is that you have some vegetation that is in um, public rights of way, and therefore under different management regimes, 
then most of the vegetation is actually in the property. So it now shifts the way ecologists and city regulators and designers, everyone needs to think about vegetation and urban systems. We have to think about interacting with the, the, the social communities. Okay, so green it up. Baltimore, fortunately or unfortunately, has an awful lot of opportunities to do that. Right? It's got 70,000 vacant homes and vacant lots. So it's got a tremendous amount of land surface area that can, can be uh, greened up. This right here, these are all the front stoops of the original row houses that used to be here. And this is a very common scene throughout downtown Baltimore. Philly's like this, Detroit's like this. There's a lot of cities out there right for redesign. Okay. Great down. This is what they did in the 70s when they didn't have money to manage anything. They just paved it. It's an elementary school with, I think, about 25 teachers. You can see their cars there. They clearly don't need that much pavement. Right? So we've been working with the, De public, with the Department of Public Works to rip that out so that water can have a chance to stay in the system and let the biological system through uptake or biological processes keep that nitrogen. Okay? So we started first small by creating a reading circle with the students and then that took off, took a life of its own. Here is that parking lot. Okay, here's that original reading circle. That parking lot is now gone. It's become a meeting place for the neighborhood, which was in need of a place. Um, and it's become a case uh, for a lot of cities for what they can do. Okay, so I'm going to shift gears because what I've been talking about in Baltimore is something very core scale. I'm talking about a whole watershed that's on the scale of 17,000 hectares. That's a pretty big area. Okay, there are definitely very big implications for people who do the design at the parcel level. Um, but now I'm going to shift a little bit to Sacramento, most, mostly because it's a slightly smaller scale work and it's also perhaps more familiar to you. But it's very similar in idea. And here's an air photo, and this is just a picture of the land covering. You can pretty much see all the parts. The buildings are in red, pavement is in gray, uh, water's blue, vegetation's always green. Okay, so what are we doing here? Well, again, we're focusing on this nitrogen export. That problem hasn't gone away. It's still the same fundamental problem. And it's leaving the land to go into the water. And what, how is it doing that? Well, it's doing that by water. Water is what's moving it across that system. And because of our Mediterranean climate with distinct wet and dry cycles, that water's coming in both in precipitation in the wet season and irrigation in the dry season. Homeowner irrigation is big here. Baltimore people don't really irrigate. It rains year round. Equal amounts year round, so they don't need to do that. So you've got precipitation and irrigation interacting with land cover. When I say land cover, what I mean by that are things like buildings, pavement, uh, vegetation of different types. That's what I'm talking about when I say land cover. So that water integrates, uh, in, interacts with the land cover, and that water leaks as runoff, okay? So that's your discharge in your system. What also leaves is going to be nitrogen sources, okay? And what nitrogen leaves is both a function of the management practices that have happened on that land cover, as well as the ecological processes that are happening or are not happening on that property. Okay, and the combination of discharge and nitrogen sources leads to your nitrogen export. So here's where we're working in Sacramento. I think you probably all rec recognize this. This is the Sacramento River, the American River. So downtown Sacramento is right here at the confluence. And we're working in 10 watersheds, residential watersheds in this area. And they look very different in terms of infrastructure. We found the, an arrangement of the different land cover types. And we're comparing it to Deer Creek Hills as a reference site, which is outside of Sacramento, off Highway 50. It's, so it's just vegetated. Um, there is a, a dirt road through it, but there's no development. Okay, so we're using that as a comparison. One of the critical things about watershed delineation, I showed you in Baltimore that we can really do it based on, on topography. The Sacramento's pretty darn flat, right? I mean, we still do watersheds based on topography, and that's what you're seeing here in this bright green line. And then we've got these terrific infrastructural maps through um, collaborators of Lauren. And that tells us where all the water is going through pipes, right? So the infrastructure here is showing you all the pipes and manhole covers and drainage systems. And so we've modified our view of watershed because in Sacramento, they could make the pipes go across topographical boundaries because you can't really see them. It's not really an issue. In Baltimore, you have to, you know, you have to use dynamite. So it's a different proposition. So what we had to do is modify our watershed boundaries. You can see especially on this side here, this purple one is our modified one, and it takes into account the drainage system. So now that definition that I gave you of watershed being topographically driven has to be modified a little bit when you think about design systems because you're designing the piping that's going to move the water across those boundaries. Okay, so you have to keep both those things in mind. 
And then we wanted to classify them because, again, the, because it interacts with land cover, we need to know the relative proportion amounts and arrangements of the different land covers. So here's two of our watersheds for comparison. They're pretty equal in size, but they differ a lot in the amount of imperviousness and vegetation in these two areas. So that just gives you a sense of what we've done in there. So the open question then is, how does this amount of imperviousness and vegetation influence the nitrate coming out of these systems? Is there a relationship between this physical structure of the land cover you know, how much grass people have decided to put in their property, how much trees have been planted, and what's the layout of the streets, has that affected uh, the nitrate export? So we've been sampling these streams, and here's discharge across all our watersheds during the dry and the wet season last year. And I'm not going to get into a lot of detail, it doesn't matter what these watersheds are. This right here, though, is Deer, Deer Creek Hills. This is our reference unurban, non-urban site, and these are all urban different types. So you can see there's a lot of variation whole lot of variation in this data. It's very noisy, but we get flow during dry season and wet season, except for Deer Creek Hills. We only get flow in the wet season. That's what we'd expect in this landscape, right? Mediterranean landscape, we get rain only in the winter. And that's what we're seeing. During the summer, there's no flow coming out of Deer Creek Hills. Well, what have we done with the urban system? We've modified it so much that we have a lot of flow during the dry season. And in some cases, we have more flow than, than during the wet season, although pay attention to those error bars. So there's a lot of flow coming out of the system when it's supposedly not raining. So what does that mean for the stream, for the chemistry of the stream and water quality? All of this flow is coming off of homeowner lots. All of that is irrigation, right? So all of that, or leaky infrastructure. So all of that is going to be influenced by fertilizer application, by homeowner, other homeowner management choices, by leaky infrastructure. Okay, so that's a fundamental altering of the ecological system because of the way that it's been designed. So this is looking at discharge. We can see that there's a lot of discharge for that year. A little bit, this is summarized by year, and then this is the mean nitrate. Again, a lot of difference across the watersheds, and that's not necessarily what I want you to pay attention to, just that there is a lot. And then here is our, our reference, very, very low. Okay, so the urban system is adding a lot of nitrate coming out of these systems. Okay, so we're trying to figure out then what different pieces of the landscape, different kinds of land cover are correlated with this nitrate output. And if you just do a straight up correlation, we see that nitrate, the amount of the concentration, those square brackets mean concentration, the concentration of nitrate coming out in our streams is positively related to the impervious surfaces, both buildings and, and roads, and, and trees. Okay, so the more trees you have, the more impervious surface you have, the more nitrate you have coming out of the system. Okay, it's negatively related to grass. So the, the more grass you have, the less nitrate you have coming out of the system. The important thing is that nitrate and discharge are not correlated, so we can separate those two. That's important for us. But keep in mind that all of these things, though, amount of grass, amount of trees, amount of buildings, it's a zero-sum game, right? There's only so much stuff you can put on the landscape. So they're not independent of each other. There are relationships between here that are not accounted for in this. So this, is, this gives us an idea but we need to control for interactions between these land cover variables to really understand how any one of them is working with or uh, is related to nitrate. So to do that, we know that building and pavement are highly related, not surprising, so we've lumped that into impervious surface, which is negative related to fine vegetation. All that means is the more impervious surface you have, the less grass you tend to have. Okay? Not surprising. But you have to do this kind of stuff to be able to analyze your data correctly. Uh, there's a weak negative relationship between biome vegetation and coarse vegetation, and trees, which is coarse vegetation, sorry, trees and buildings are positively related, even though vegetation is not related to impervious surface or pavement. And we think that's because in the Sacramento landscape, people are planting a lot of trees next to buildings for shade. So we see this relationship, but it's not really related to the intensity of urbanization or or anything like that. It's really, we think the mechanism is that they're, they're planting these things next to buildings for shade. Okay, so now that we know these relationships, we can hold one constant and look at the effect of the other independently, so in a partial regression. So for example, our data told us that as you increase the amount of grass, okay, the amount of nitrate coming out of your system decreases. So we said there was a negative relationship. As you increase grass, your nitrate goes down, okay? But then we wanted to say, does that, we know that this vegetation is related to 
impervious surface. So if we hold impervious surface constant, is that still true? And in fact, it is. So that's a robust relationship. Okay. As impervious surface goes up, nitrate goes up. Well, we know that impervious surface is related to grass. If we hold that constant, is that still true? No. So impervious surface and nitrate really aren't related. Okay. That's a statistical fallacy based on the relationship between impervious surface and grass. So the partial regression results are that building and, and trees are positively related to the amount of nitrate coming out of the streams. The amount of buildings you have and the amount of vegetation are positively related, but if you account for the relationship between buildings and coarse vegetation, uh, trees are, really, are no longer related to the amount of nitrate coming out that buildings are. Uh, in addition, court, uh, the, tree, the amount of trees and the amount of grass are related statistically significantly related to the amount of nitrate coming out of the system, but again, there's a relationship between the vegetation types, and if you take that into account, the trees are no longer related to the nitrate. Okay, that matches this, but the fine vegetation is still related. Impervious surfaces and fine vegetation are related to nitrate, but again, there's a relationship between imperviousness and, and uh, fine vegetation. If you keep that constant, imperviousness is no longer related to nitrate, but one element of imperviousness, the building, is related to nitrate, and that holds true with this. Okay, so you have to be a little bit careful when you're looking at land cover in that these things are not independent of each other. So that's why I've gone through all this statistical stuff that I know is a bit of a drag, but I don't want to leave you with the message of gee, this is always related to this. That's not the case. These things are interacting with each other. Okay, so to wrap it up, the data impervious surface alone didn't correlate with the amount of nitrate coming into the system. So impervious surface, remember, relates to both the amount of buildings you're putting on the landscape as well as the amount of um, hardscape. Building cover, though, as a subset of that impervious, is positively correlated with nitrate. Okay, the more buildings you have, the more nitrate you're going to flush out of the system. Uh, fine vegetation, which in this landscape is grass, is lawn. Uh, the more lawn you have, the less nitrate you're going to release into, into the water. So what are the mechanisms? These are just patterns. What are some potential mechanisms? We don't know yet. This, is, this will involve some future experiments. But possible mechanisms for the building relationship here is that we have fertilizer use. Buildings signify home ownership. We have fertilizer use and potentially domestic irrigation, especially in the summertime. And that's flushing. It's, it's a source and it's a, it's a source of the nitrogen and it's a, a source of the movement of that nitrogen into the water. Okay? This negative relationship between the grass is, we think, more of an ecological process, that that grass is growing so fast that it's absorbing the nitrogen and holding it immobile in the tissue. So it's, it's keeping it in the terrestrial system. Okay, very similar to that Baltimore story I was telling you, this is the biotic uptake that we hope for. Okay, that's what's going on there. Okay, key thing here is this, the system has become fundamentally shifted from, sorry, I should change the language here, from an ephemeral system, meaning doesn't flow year round, to a perennial system by residential water use. Okay, so we've gone from a system that should only run during the winter to one that is now flowing uh, year round. And that's going to really fundamentally alter our system. So if we go back to the basic nitrogen cycle, um, hopefully what I've been able to show you is that we have a lot of different sources of input. Okay, and so that is one way to target this problem. You could look at trying to, to communicate with homeowners to reduce fertilizer use, to try to reduce atmospheric deposition, and those, those activities are certainly, um, certainly happening. But because of the, the system, we know that a key way is to go through this enhancing biotic uptake or enhancing this denitrification process. This denitrification process, because it requires waterlogged soils and space, is more difficult to do. Um, but organic uptake potentially um, is a way to do it, and that's, I had a, a conifer tree there before, so now I put some graphs there based on the data. Okay, so that's where I'm going to stop. Uh, I do teach a class, Urban Ecology, that talks about how ecological patterns and processes are um, altered in urban environments, and that happens next quarter, and one of you, at least in here, has taken it, and that's it. That's all off my lap and helped out. So I'm happy to discuss. Any questions for Mary? Yeah. Uh, I remember when you were teaching class, you said that when you moved to Sacramento, they wouldn't allow you to plant, was it native grasses or was it the district? Something about your lawn, they were restricting. What you oh, me personally in yeah. my neighborhood. So I'm, I'm still fighting with my neighbors. 
Okay. Yeah. Have Sacramento's changed at all in the last year? Well, it, you know, you have to keep the regulation separate from the social contract. The regulation apparently doesn't say that I have to keep it in law. The social contract with all the neighbors who scream and yell as they see what I'm doing to my front yard says that I need to keep it in law. So there's two different things at play there, and I have to be a little bit careful about it. Yeah. The story's still the same. I still have, now it's dead law in front of my house. Steven. Or Steven Steven. <laughs> Steve Willard. Uh, have you looked into, in your nitrogen cycle, nitrous oxide, which is a very common greenhouse gas? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I didn't talk about it because I, I do want to talk to the ecosystem ecology class. Um, nitrous oxide is an intermediary step of that denitrification process. If the denitrification process doesn't go all the way to N2 gas, it creates nitrous oxide, and that is a greenhouse gas. So the problem is, is when you do it halfway, and you get it just that far, and it blows off this nitrous oxide, you've got a bigger problem on your hands, yes. So the, the point is, the, the key would be to keep those systems fully functioning so that you could push that process all the way through the whole denitrification process to NG gas. Yeah. So that's just, I didn't, it's a basic nitrogen cycle. <laughs> but yeah, that's a really good point. A lot of these things have trade-offs. The question I was kind of expecting to get from you all is, Lon, come on, you just told us that that's what homeowners are throwing a bunch of fertilizer and water on, but then you just told us that it's great for holding nitrate. And that is one of the great unanswered questions that I'm sure I will be working on for the next eh, 15 years. Well, it just means that grass isn't the issue. Management is the issue. Potentially. The potentially. We need to do much more. We need to know what that management is. Right. And you know, the, the, the kind of work that Lauren is doing is, is going to be key to sorting some of that stuff out, too. Because you have such a great manipulated plot that you can control on. It's very difficult to actually collect water off one person's lot. Yeah, that's really good. <coughs> okay, that was my question. Oh, I'm but sorry. I have a follow-up to that. Um, so you saw a negative association with nitrate with five situation which you're defining as grass. It's grass in this landscape. And yes. you had a positive association with coarse vegetation, which you define as trees. trees. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm, I'm wondering, Trees have deeper root systems that would kind typically species, but yeah. intercept any you know, going for any uh, nitrate going into the uh, right. ground. Yeah. And that's what we would sort of expect. Yeah. All the studies I've seen about, uh, my, my actual question is about golf courses. Oh. Because there you've got an enormous amount of fine vegetation in your scheme. Yeah, but yet, there you go. I mean, they've got so much nitrogen on them. Um, they have so much fertilizer applied to them, it's hard to think about them. Um, so as a special case, they would violate that, probably violate Probably. That. And this is what Carrie was saying with the management right. kind of thing. The thing about the trees, though, is that, and I'm not a hydrologist, but from what I understand, the groundwater in the Sacramento area is kind of, it just goes. It's so deep that it doesn't actually come back into our surface stream. So we don't have to account for groundwater in these systems because it just leaves out the bottom and goes to bigger, coarser scale um, stuff. So, um, yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure about the deep root system. The fact that trees are positive with nitrate, I'm not <coughs> sure I know what that means yet. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure I know what that means. Yeah. Other than it indicates yards, but then so does lawn. So we're still trying to, this is just a one year worth of data, so we're still trying to pull this apart. So I would welcome any ideas for sorting things out. Yeah. I have another question about the fine vegetation. Do you guys make distinctions with the like native grasses versus native yeah. versus the yeah. turf grasses? Because right. your test site is up in the foot, so right. Right. you have different types. That's right. That's why it's called fine vegetation, because these are all analyzed from the satellite images uh, and air photos. So we call it fine and coarse based on the texture that you see on the screen. Okay. So they're it's all kind of that's why it's so ugly. So fine is, is both turf grass and it's, it's basically herbaceous material. Yeah. Um, but because we're comparing across residential watersheds, we don't have a lot of that kind of grassland landscape. That's why I say we can call it turf. 
gets much more complicated in a place like Baltimore where it isn't all turf because they just grow weeds like crazy. But there we have to stay herbaceous. Anything else? All right, thank you very much.